I've come to realize an unfortunate truth. In many cases, it's almost impossible to have an authentic experience with an old piece of media, particularly older video games. Call of Duty Finest Hour is one of these games. I picked it up alongside Big Red One for a mere buck fifty apiece at my local retro shop, and just minutes after booting it up, it had me thinking. Playing Finest Hour today, it's hard to miss all of the Call of Duty-isms that would be refined in later games than cloned ad nauseum by imitators. Scripted events leading the player between set pieces, whack-a-mole enemy AI, and that crisp signature gunplay. But while some series staples were surprisingly already present in 2004, the ones that are missing make Finest Hour a hard pill to swallow. Sprint mechanics, precise and responsive input, targeted 60 frames per second, regenerating health and generous checkpoints. A mixture of tech improvements and game design norms so widespread in the decade and a half following Finest Hour's release that playing a game without them is downright distracting. So much so that one tends to forget that none of these things were expected from a console shooter in 2004. Now, I've been playing a lot of the new Modern Warfare. So to say that my first few minutes of playing the PS2 version of the first ever Call of Duty game were rough would be an understatement. While mechanically similar, Finest Hour lacks the polish of its younger siblings, due to a variety of contributing factors. Weak hardware, lower budget, kind of. The decision to reuse renderware instead of ID Tech 3, and most notably, outsourced development. If you've seen any of my other videos, you know it well. Oftentimes, when porting a big budget game to a less powerful console, outside teams will be hired on to develop said version so the main dev team can focus all of their efforts on the lead platform. These outsourced titles often amount to what are simply scaled down versions of games modified to run on less powerful hardware. Sometimes, these studios end up producing entirely separate games which simply share a name, theme, and some elements of their source material. Call of Duty Finest Hour is in this latter category. To a point, it's a spin-off, a unique game made specifically for consoles. But given that COD 1 was a PC exclusive, I think it's fair to say that this was Activision's way of giving console owners a taste of the PC exclusive big leagues. Finest Hour was developed by Spark Unlimited, a small American studio which closed in 2015, after four of their five completed games failed to attain even a 60% aggregate review score. The one exception was Finest Hour, which received generally positive reviews. Ironically, it was also their first game, but despite providing a largely downgraded experience, it still featured most of the things that made Infinity Ward's PC game noteworthy. Somewhat grounded scenarios, gritty themes, innovative shooting mechanics, and even an adaptation of the game's online multiplayer, which can still be played if you can find people willing to boot up excellent Kai or a custom PS2 DNS. There are a lot of reasons the separate game's same name route can be taken. Hardware capabilities are a big factor, as handhelds obviously couldn't handle your average AAA game. And the same could be said about some PC games which received heavily modified console ports, often due to performance constraints or just not being well suited for a controller. It made sense to change things up for these platforms, but unfortunately in a lot of cases the team hired to create these games simply were not capable of delivering a AAA quality product, either due to time, money, or experience. Fifteen years and a staggering 28 Call of Duty games later, the influence the franchise has had is absolutely massive. For better or for worse, it's safe to say that the series has earned a spot alongside the likes of Halo, Doom, Virtual Racing, Grand Theft Auto, and Mario Bros. as one of the most influential video games of all time. And while Modern Warfare wouldn't come along and springboard the series into the limelight until four years after the original Call of Duty launched, the seeds were there from the start. And to give credit where it's due, it must be said that Spark Unlimited did a fantastic job translating Call of Duty's spirit and feeling into the living room. Keep in mind, this was the first time the game appeared on consoles, and for an era where control schemes are very much still being figured out, it's remarkable how close to today's Call of Duty games this one controls. Going back to this game today is difficult due to its relatively low fidelity and lack of modern mechanics we've come to expect in the years since, but if you can get past that, it's genuinely worth playing for fans of the series. Just like its PC counterpart, Finest Hour's single-player campaign is split into smaller Soviet, British, and American campaign sections, each portraying parts of real battles from the Second World War. Unlike Final Fronts, Finest Hour has some semblance of distinct characters, including playable Soviet sniper Tanya Pavlovna, and Sergeant Bob Starkey, a British commando voiced by Brian Johnson. Yes, that Brian Johnson. Because audiences in 2004 were apparently foaming at the mouth to have the frontman of ACDC lead them into battle. These characters aren't exactly fleshed out, receiving nowhere close to the amount of development and attention given to characters in the Modern Warfare era, but they're certainly much more interesting than those in Final Fronts, earning the narrative a bit more of my attention. With that being said, it would be a stretch to call the campaign memorable. Not unlike Infinity Ward's PC games, story takes a backseat to simply portraying battles of World War II. 
While this no doubt contributed to the market's fatigue and eventual rejection of World War II video games, one could argue that the execution served to further Call of Duty's goals in a way. In an era where most shooters were one-man power fantasies, games like Medal of Honor and Call of Duty stood out by being gritty, grounded, and relatively realistic, thanks in part to the decision to create believable, ordinary soldiers instead of action heroes. Of course, the series would later free itself from the shackles of real-world battles and create original stories instead. But at the time, not many games had done what Call of Duty did, and none of that is lost in the translation of Spark's port. What is lost in translation, though, is the polish. Call of Duty, regardless of platform, has always been known for tight controls. When I reviewed World at War Final Fronts, I criticized its aiming controls rather harshly, and while I stand by that criticism, I do have to concede that what we now know as the standard first-person shooter control layout was only just being established during the sixth generation. Even after Halo came out with what would ultimately be the way almost every shooter tackles controls, developers in every corner of the market were still experimenting, sometimes out of necessity, as one size does not necessarily fit all. Finest Hour has similar issues to those I mentioned in the Final Fronts review. Final Fronts had no excuse to feel as bad as it did in 2008, but 2004 was early enough in the console shooter wave that Finest Hour's shortcomings are understandable. Still, it's hard to ignore the jank when minor touches to the stick don't even register, meaning you have to kinda manhandle the sticks to get response. But then you overshoot, because your crosshair moved farther than expected. Sensitivity fluctuates with the unstable frame rate, and to make matters worse, the hit detection is inconsistent to begin with. All of which means that hitting long-range shots with any sort of consistency or speed is pretty much off the table. This is really frustrating, leading to the player taking what feels like unfair damage. And seeing as there's no regenerating health in the earliest COD games, you'll have to hunt for health kits to make it back up. And while it almost always feels easy, there are some times where the design is just blatantly unfair given the amount of health kits and ammo at your disposal, and with damage from faraway snipers or machine gunners being unavoidable due to the impossibility of precise aim with the DualShock. Grenades can explode next to a group of enemies without earning a kill, and machine gunners have hitboxes that I truly believe make up less than half of their body. Outside of accuracy, the AI leaves something to be desired as well, with really rough pathing. More than once I was body blocked by a friendly AI in a way that hurt or killed me, and... Oh my god, fucking again? These issues are frustrating, but oddly not omnipresent. The Soviet campaign, true to the battles it's based on, is a more defensive affair, with the player sniping from afar, piloting a tank, and holding a warehouse. Even when the player is on the offensive, the level design, enemy density, and admittedly more generous health packs make this campaign much less frustrating. The surprisingly short North Africa campaign is where it all starts to fall apart. There are a lot of areas in this game where the level design is completely incongruent with the controls. With MG42 nests and faraway riflemen being able to precisely laser you the second you poke your head out of cover. There's manufactured challenge every time you encounter these nests or snipers, because there's simply nothing you can do about them short of just throwing yourself at them over and over and hoping you eventually get a lucky shot. The enemy AI are exceedingly dumb in almost every other situation, making these encounters feel like they exist solely to pad runtime. With all of that frustration out in the open, it's easy to dismiss this game as trash, especially with the lines between console and PC gaming being blurred in recent years. But if I was a kid in 2008 that hadn't upgraded to the 7th gen yet, I doubt I'd be singing the same tune. As a matter of fact, I was that kid. I vividly remember playing Test Drive Unlimited on the PS2 in winter 2007, a game produced by the very same means as Finest Hour. While the PS2 port is a significant downgrade from the Xbox 360 version, I absolutely loved it as a kid. And let me tell you, 10-year-old Case had some discerning taste in racing games. And I'm not the only one. You guys have left an overwhelming number of comments on my other port videos expressing nostalgia for these games, having played them growing up. Perspectives like these remind me of my own childhood. Compromises aside, these games still served an important purpose. Games like Half-Life 2, The Sims, and wait for it, Roller Coaster Tycoon, reached console audiences that wouldn't have experienced them if they had remained PC exclusive. Likewise, gamers holding on to last-gen hardware got a taste of next-gen games like Star Wars The Force Unleashed, Need for Speed, and <sighs> Call of Duty World at War. Were they great representations of the games meant to emulate? Usually not, but they were never really meant to be. The most important thing to remember about these games is that the people who bought them most likely did so because they had no other way of getting their hands on the real thing. Nobody played Final Fronts over the next-gen version of the game by choice. And believe me, nobody looked at this and thought it would be better without a mouse. I mean, really. What kind of crazy person would play the low-budget version of a AAA game if they- Oh. And all of this brings me back to authenticity. When I say it's impossible to have an authentic experience with a particular game today, I say so out of reference, not distaste. Ports like Finest Hour fill a specific consumer niche. 
people didn't have PCs to experience Infinity Ward's fully realized concept. Even ignoring the performance and input issues presented by the port, the actual mechanics of Spark's Call of Duty feel antiquated by today's standards. But at the time, the gritty World War II realism Call of Duty brought to the table was a fresh and desirable experience, an evolution of what the team had started with Medal of Honor Allied Assault. For all its flaws, Finest Hour is an excellent representation of the original Call of Duty. Certainly much better than I had expected from my previous romp with the series' 6th gen outings. If I was someone who, back in 2003, only had a PlayStation 2 and a PC not suitable for gaming, I'd be all over this. And judging by the comments of the World at War video, I'd hazard a guess that y'all would be too. That sort of emotion is lost on us today, and I feel like a lot of games get a bad rep because of it. All of them have value beyond how we experience them today, and for that, they deserve our respect.